Right now, in a small town in the east coast of Peninsula Malaysia, I've always been naturally drawn right, to nature. I love going to the beach, spending time with my best friend Sashi collecting seashells, and watching, you know, as the sun set. It's simply beautiful. But as much as I really enjoyed my childhood and, and nature, at a very young age, I've also seen nature's wrath. At the young age of 10, you know, when I was still in primary school, I still remember one of the floods that hit was really terrible. I could remember the cries of some of the villages in my community saying, evacuate, evacuate. As I actually when water levels were sort of rising above uh, knee levels. In one of the school halls that we were evacuated to, one of the volunteers called out Sasha's name. But there was a pregnant silence. He was nowhere to be seen. We found out the following day that Sashi had actually been swept away by the current, uh, drowned and died. One can only imagine the amount of devastation that his parents, his family members would have. And that perhaps was also one of my first introduction to this sense of loss and then death, perhaps, at a very young age. Now, the image that you see on the screen is what we call the blue marble. It's one of the first few images that was actually taken by a scientist, by NASA, of a beautiful planet Earth. Isn't it beautiful? No? Yes? But I wanted to also introduce a kick start, right? We talk with this really big word. Uh, any guesses how, how, how one should pronounce this? Anyone? That's a really big word, right? So, so there, it's anthropocentrism. Uh, it's really divided into two parts. Anthropo, which means human beings, like us, mankind. And centrism, which means that it's being at the center of things. So this concept is really about how human beings, like you and I, mankind, are constantly putting ourselves at the center of decision making. In whatever that we do, it's all about us first. And what do you think are the potential impacts of this? Perhaps like, we'll be exploring this in uh, further detail through my talk. So when we saw the beautiful blue marble, right, we all of us say that, wow, you know, it looks really magnificent, right? It's, it's really a work of art. But unfortunately, when you start zooming down into further details, taking a more microscopic view, perhaps, of planet Earth, you would realize that it's plagued with a lot of issues, problems. You know, we have uh, industrial processes, uh, manufacturing plants that are constantly emitting high amounts of greenhouse gases, your carbon, methane, directly into the atmosphere, hence causing global warming. On another end of the spectrum, you have, you know, deforestation activities, where a lot of you know, our valuable assets are being chopped off, cut down. There's our forest, by the way, is supposed to be a carbon sink, right, in Malaysia. And we are one of the 12 most mega diverse countries in the world. But yet, we're losing a lot of these assets at an accelerated pace. And all of this is happening simply because, you know, mankind is exploiting natural resources in order to make sure that you know, we get the hate in life. But when, really, would this stop? When enough is enough? So if you look at some of the data or facts around, you know, like climate science, all of us know that, you know, in the 1950s, like temperatures typically take on a bit of a mean curve, right? Uh, but however, like progressively over the years, we have actually been seeing a huge shift towards higher mean temperatures. So much so that extreme weather events, floods, droughts, forest fires, they used to cover only about 0.1% of our Earth's surface. But that number has really increased by about 14% in the 21st century. And to make matters worse, 
Uh, this is actually a record that, we're, that we really shouldn't be very proud of. Because year after year, we seem to be breaking uh, the highest temperature record on planet Earth. This, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is really not something that you know, we should be proud of. So the question that I will throw back is, what do you think happens when the balance between mankind and nature goes out of sync? What happens when anthropocentrism takes place at the center? And this is what, you know, I, these are some examples that I want to review, right, to the audience today. You know, we have been experiencing kids' rest. So in Amitabha in India, there's already been recorded that more than 2,000 odd people have died, right, in 2015 alone, just as a result of the terrible heat wave, right? Our global systems are extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate. And when I talk about global systems, I'm referring to our food supply. So we have an ever-growing uh, population, right, that's happening, you know, our population growth is really happening at an exponential rate. A key question that we need to ask is, how are we going to be able to sustain ourselves? How are we going to be able to feed our ever-growing population? Right? And crop use are already on a huge decline as a result of climate change, right? Due to floods and, and droughts. What about our water system? You know, has anyone here experienced uh, water security issues? Right? Especially those that are living in the Klang Valley, you turn on your taps and, and there's no water running. Can you imagine? Like, you know, this is, we're talking about the 21st century here, and still, there are many people in different parts of the world you know, who struggle in order to get, you know, like secure, like proper water uh, uh, security, which is a huge problem. And of course, needless to say, uh, climate change also has an impact, right, on global health. So as I mentioned earlier, two thirds of, you know, human calorific uh, crops, right, like corn, wheat, uh, rice, and soy, like are actually affected just by one degree Celsius of increase, right, in temperature. As a result of, you know, like human activities, anthropogenic, right, like we're constantly pumping up greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. The percentages here might look small, but imagine if you were really looking at the, this, right, on a global scale, the impact is really, really massive. What else ha what would happen? We spoke about global health, right? With one degree Celsius of temperature increase, you know, it actually affects the whole biological systems and, and biodiversity in terms of how they breed. So one common example that uh, most people cite is actually the Aedes mosquito, right? Like who has heard about the Aedes mosquito breed in tropical areas? Yes? No? So, so a, a, a typical mosquito goes through, right, a metamorphosis process, right? It goes from an egg to a larvae to a full-grown uh, adult mosquito. So this breed has already ingested Zika, right, as part of its diet, right? But however, before uh, the Zika uh, virus is able to incubate successfully in the mosquito, it would have actually died out, okay? Uh, the mosquito would have died, so it's not actually dangerous. But under warmer conditions, what science is telling us is that the virus that is being ingested by this uh, mosquito is able to replicate a lot faster which means that this breed of mosquito is actually now a vector of, of disease. And mind you, as I've mentioned earlier, in Malaysia, in, in a tropical region, like we are one of the most mega diverse countries, right, in the world. Can you imagine with just one degree Celsius of increase in temperature, we're able to alter, you know, the, the cycle of, of a mosquito. Can you imagine how much more impact, right, this would have, right, on other flora and fauna? And it's a domino effect. What happens to you know, a certain species affects another. And this is what happens when nature and, and mankind, our interrelationships, go out of sync. So the cost of carbon is extremely clear. I think I, I've highlighted you know, like, uh, the different uh, issues that we've been facing. But really, a key question that we have to ask ourselves is, must we change? knowing all of the data, the statistics, the science that has already been so evidently clear that has been presented before you today, must we change? And, and I hope the answer is a resounding yes. 
But the key question, the next question is, can we actually change? Is there hope? Or is, is it all just doom and gloom? So a lot of scientists are saying that we're really not on track, right? To heating the 1.5 degrees Celsius, capital temperatures are increasing by 1.5 degrees Celsius. Is there hope? And can we change? So I want to make this argument that we can, and we do have the solutions at hand. You know, anthropocentricity doesn't have to be, you know, like the, a, a fundamental way of actually, you know, thinking and addressing uh, issues. We need to relook and revision a new future. So, just by means of an example, we have actually made huge solar energy progress. Like in the year 2002, the solar energy market was actually projected to grow by just one gigawatt per year by the year 2010. But the reality of the matter is we have actually hit 17 times and 75 times in the year 2016, exceeding what we had initially projected. And a lot of countries are actually making, you know, like huge strides to phase out fossil fuel vehicles, like not just in Norway and Netherlands, but also in places like, like in Asia, right? India, China, among many others. A lot of companies have also really stepped up to the plate, making huge commitments of wanting to commit to 100% renewables. Moving away from a fossil fuel future, moving away from a huge reliance of oil and gas. If companies can commit to this, I'm very sure that so can different countries worldwide. So we have established two things. We know that we need to change and revision the way that we think. We know that we have the solutions at hand, right? Just by giving some of the examples that I've stated. But the key here, really, it's the will. Do we have the will to change as individuals? Do you? Yes? No? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I strongly believe right, in, in the people movement. You know, there have been a lot of climate marches that have taken place demanding uh, political leaders to make strikes and, and change, to enact laws that would actually protect our planet and ensure that there is a secure future uh, for uh, our younger ones. There's been a lot of clean energy revolution uh, that, that is taking place worldwide. And I just want to show you this image, right, of uh, what I would consider three leaders. You have Malala, who is a human rights uh, advocate. Uh, you have Rita Thunberg, a climate activist. And the Isabel and Malati uh, sisters, who initiated Bye Bye Plastics, right, in Bali, at the young age of 11 or 12. They started a whole movement around, you know, like the No Plastics movement, right, in, in the island, at such a tender young age. So what do you think they have in common? Yeah. They're young. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, like female leaders, yes. What do they represent in this day and age? Yeah, the, the will to change, as I've sort of alluded to. It all starts with actually understanding what the state of the matter is, understanding what the issues are, knowing that there is a change, and more importantly, trying to spark that will, right, that we can actually make a difference in whatever capacity that we are in. You know, when, when these three, you know, like young change makers, as I would say, started on their journey of wanting to inspire change, they were all young. There probably were a lot of uh, barriers or challenges, saying that, you know, like they're inexperienced, you know, some might even say that, oh yeah, because you're a female leader, so chances are, right, they won't be able to make much difference. But they have proven societal, you know, this, they've actually challenged the societal norms around all of these issues and really step up to the plate. And they are making huge strides globally. So it leaves me, right, with this uh, image, right, which I've uh, shown or started, right, in, in my talk earlier, uh, which is really an image of the blue marble, our, our beautiful planet. You know, we say that the whole idea, you know, of why we started this is because we want to protect this planet. And we need to do it, not just 
to, and to ensure that you know, we continue to sustain ourselves, but that there is a future where younger generations can actually thrive. So the topic today, right, that we've explored on the human superiority complex, anthropocentrism, putting human beings at the center of everything, is really an ideology that I would like to challenge. And I think in order for us to revision our future, we have to make sure that the relationships between the human race and our planet is always in sync. Thank you very much uh, for listening.